Hi, right, engineers. In this video, we are going to talk about cholinergic receptors. These are extremely important because they are specifically for the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so cholinergic receptors, they fall under two different types of categories, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. One is called nicotinic. Okay, so here, let's, let's write this down here. Let's say we have two different types of cholinergic. What does that mean to be cholinergic? Cholinergic receptors, I'm going to put R here, means that these receptors respond to acetylcholine. That's it. That's all it is. It just means that these receptors are responding to acetylcholine. There's two different types here. So if I have here cholinergic receptors, there's one type, which are called nicotinic receptors. Now, nicotinic receptors, they respond to acetylcholine, but they also respond to something that can act as an agonist to that. In other words, an agonist is just saying it can exert the same effects. Nicotinic receptors respond to acetylcholine and nicotine. Okay, that is the agonist here. But there is two different types of nicotinic receptors in actuality. One is we denote it as N, N, okay? This is the nicotinic receptors which are on neurons. Okay, these are the nicotinic receptors that are present on neurons, and we'll talk about these. And there's another one which are called N, M. And these are the nicotinic receptors which are present at the actual neuromuscular junction on the muscle cells, specifically the skeletal muscles. So again, the nicotinic receptors that are present on the neurons are present in like two basic locations, right? One is they're gonna be found at the ganglia, an autonomic ganglia. So they can be found at what's called autonomic ganglia. So you know whenever you have, for example, this is a perfect example, we said autonomic ganglia. This right here is a ganglia. A ganglia is a group of cell bodies that are located within the peripheral nervous system. There's two types though, right? We have preganglionic motor neurons that are for parasympathetic and preganglionic motor neurons that are gonna go to the sympathetic ganglia. But either way, these uh, nicotinic receptors are present on the actual ganglia. So for example, if I had, let's say I have one like this. Here is going to be a presynaptic neuron, and it's gonna release acetylcholine. That acetylcholine is going to bind onto a postganglionic motor neuron, which is gonna go out and perform some specific function. Maybe it might release acetylcholine if it's a parasympathetic, postganglionic, or it might release norepinephrine if it's a sympathetic postganglionic. But these receptors that are present on the cell body here, those are the nicotinic receptors that are present on the autonomic ganglia. So we can denote that as NN. They're also present in so many other places within the central nervous system. They can be found in so many different areas of the central nervous system. So we can find this in the central nervous system in so many places, okay? That is the significance here. And again, we said that the nicotinic receptors that are present on the actual neuromuscular junction are specific to skeletal muscles. These are specific only to skeletal muscles that are present at the neuromuscular junction, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about these, but before we do that, I wanna talk about another group of uh, cholinergic receptors. So I'm gonna talk about the next group and then after that we'll dive into the nicotinic and then we'll dive into the next one. Okay, the other subtype of cholinergic receptors is of the category muscarinic receptors. So now the next one is called muscarinic receptors. Now muscarinic receptors means that they can respond not only to acetylcholine, but they can respond to a chemical called muscarin. So muscarin can also act as an agonist, in other words it exerts the same effects as acetylcholine on these receptors. And there are so many different types of muscarinic receptors. There's actually five types, so M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. We are gonna mainly, mainly focus in this video on M1 to M3 because these are the most relevant to this discussion. M4 and M5, they're also not found in too many locations. They're specifically found within the central nervous system. Okay, but we're gonna talk primarily about M1, M2, and M3. 
Okay. Now the next thing I want to talk about is we know that this is how we can we can classify these two, two different types of receptors. But the next thing is we should def uh, define them in another way. Nicotinic receptors are what we refer to as metabo, I'm sorry, um, I ion channels. These are ion channels, but these ion channels are ligand gated. So we can actually even add on to this definition of nicotinic receptors, and we can say that these ion channels are ligand gated ion channels. Okay, so nicotinic receptors that are present on the autonomic ganglia, central nervous system, or skeletal muscle cells are going to be ligand gated or chemically gated ion channels, and I'll explain that. Whereas muscarinic receptors are primarily what we refer to as uh, G protein coupled receptors. Okay, these are also called serpentine receptors. Uh, that means that they pass through the membrane like a snake a total of seven times. So these are really, really important. Okay, so now that we understand there's two different types of cholinergic receptors, we understand how these receptors are structurally and functionally different. Now let's talk about the mechanisms by which these receptors function. Okay, so first things first, let's talk really briefly about the nicotinic receptors present on the autonomic ganglia and on the central nervous system. Okay, so let me zoom back in to this diagram that we just had here a second ago. So let's do this right here. Let's say here, I'm going to have a presynaptic neuron. So here's my presynaptic neuron, this one right here. Off of that, I'm gonna have another one. And this guy right here is going to be my postsynaptic neuron. So this is my postsynaptic neuron. What happens is, is we have these nicotinic receptors that are present on the actual postsynaptic membrane. Okay, of this postsynaptic neuron. Let's do these guys in this baby blue color. So look, here is going to be this receptor. And these receptors are so darn cool. Let's pretend for a second, this, this channel, this actual ion channel has, is closed. There's like a little gate right up above them, right? There's a gate right up above them. But then there's a little pocket, kind of like a seesaw, if you will. Here's like a little pocket, like a seesaw. What happens is these presynaptic neurons, they can release a chemical from these autonomic ganglia called acetylcholine, right? And what happens is acetylcholine can come and bind onto that little pocket right there. So I'll pretend it binds onto that little pocket. And when it sits on the pocket, it's just like a seesaw. It sits on it, what's that little gate gonna do? It's gonna fly up. When that flies up, it's gonna open up the ion channel. So the ion channel was previously closed, but upon the binding of acetylcholine, look, the, the actual gate opens. And then guess who can start flowing in? Sodium ions. So sodium ions can start flooding in to this actual postsynaptic neuron. And if sodium ions start flooding into this postsynaptic neuron, what is it gonna start doing to this guy? it's going to try to excite this guy. It's not gonna cause an action potential. It's not, gonna de it's not gonna trigger an action potential down the axon, not yet. The reason why is, is you for pretend here, we're gonna talk about this more when we get into neuro, uh, like on resting membrane potential. But here, let's say that a cell has a resting membrane potential right here of negative 70 millivolts, right? Then right here, we're gonna have a threshold potential. And let's assume that that is negative 55. Now, what is this threshold specifically for? Let's put here in this bright color, actually no, let's do it here in purple. There's a special channel right here, and I'm gonna make it really big here, because this channel is very, very specific. This purple channel here is a voltage-gated sodium channel. Voltage-gated sodium channel. Voltage-gated sodium channels only open, so this is a voltage-gated sodium channel. 
these only open when you hit a certain threshold, negative 55. When acetylcholine binds onto these nicotinic receptors, so what is this receptor right here, this blue one? This is called a nicotinic receptor, and particularly of the N category, the neuron. It opens up these channels and allows for sodium ions to slowly trickle in. As the sodium ions slowly trickle in, the resting membrane potential starts rising and approaching threshold potential. When it approaches threshold potential and hits threshold potential, guess what happens? These voltage-gated sodium channels open, and sodium will flood into the cell. And this will propagate down the axon, and that is called an action potential. So the action potential is generated by the voltage-gated sodium channels. But now my question is, what is that little blue line representing? What did these nicotinic receptors do? They generated a little excitation on this postsynaptic membrane. And we call this excitation an excitatory postsynaptic potential, also referred to as a EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. That is what's happening here in the autonomic ganglia. Okay, cool, what's happening in the central nervous system? Here's what I want you guys to remember. Acetylcholine is so important, they have all these different types of things that they tell you nowadays that you can use or take that can help you to increase your acetylcholine and there's a reason why. Acetylcholine is so important because in different neurons, in the different circuitry of the central nervous system, we're gonna have those nicotinic receptors, those here I'm gonna put in, in. And they can be present all over the entire central nervous system and they respond to acetylcholine. So whenever acetylcholine is present, it can bind onto these nicotinic receptors and trigger the different circuitries within the brain. But here's what I want you guys to remember. What is that circuitry responsible for? Why is this happening? What is the significance of it? The significance of it within the central nervous system is three basic functions. One is acetylcholine plays a significant role in memory. Of all the importance, this is probably of the most important within the central nervous system. They've shown studies that decrease in acetylcholine and acetylcholine receptors results in a decrease in memory. Also, they play, it plays a role with an arousal. And then the last one is analgesia, okay? So analgesia. Okay, so that's these three significant things that you should remember with inside of the, uh, the neuron circuitry of the central nervous system. The basic thing is, is cognitive function. He plays a significant role within cognitive function of the central nervous system. Okay. And that covers the nicotinic receptors on the autonomic ganglia in the central nervous system. Now I want to talk about the nicotinic receptors that are present on the skeletal muscles. If you guys watch our myology videos, we've talked about this in so many different ways, so I don't, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here, but I'm just going to say that we have these nicotinic receptors, and, and their structure isn't significantly like important. They do have like alpha chains, and they have beta chains, and delta chains, and gamma chains, and stuff like that. But... Um, What's important here is that there's different proteins, a total of like five different proteins that come together and make this nicotinic receptor. Now on the nicotinic receptor, there's two uh, domains or these little uh, acetylcholine binding sites. So these are like, these right here are the acetylcholine binding sites. It's like our, our, the domain for it, right? What happens is, this is so cool. Okay, so remember within the actual spinal cord, we have two different types of neurons. We've been focusing primarily on the autonomic, okay? Now, if we talk about this next one, coming from the anterior gray horn of the ventral gray horn of the spinal cord, you have your somatic motor neurons. So let's assume that this guy right here is an alpha motor neuron. This alpha motor neuron is a somatic motor neuron. It only takes one motor neuron to reach the effector organ. Whereas in the autonomic nervous system, it takes two motor neurons to reach the effector organ. Anyway, these action potentials can come down the alpha motor neuron. As the action potentials come down the alpha motor neuron, you know that there'll be calcium, like if we kind of zoomed in here, you know there's vesicles here, and these vesicles are rich in acetylcholine. And what happens is, is there's special channels here present on the synaptic nerve terminal, which are calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium channels. And as calcium starts rushing into these 
uh, axon terminals, you remember it activates like synaptobrevin, syntaxin, and it triggers the exocytosis of acetylcholine. Now what happens is acetylcholine is going to have to bind on to these sites here. So these, these two uh, ACH binding sites are domains present on this nicotinic receptor, which is present on the skeletal muscle sarcolemma, which is just a cell membrane. When acetylcholine binds onto this, guess what it does? Normally the channel is closed, so it's constricted, right? But then acetylcholine binds onto these two pockets, and guess what? Whoop, that sucker opens. When that opens, it allows for particularly two ions to move in and out of the cell. One ion is going to be sodium. Sodium is going to rush into the cell. Now as sodium comes into this cell, it's gonna make the cell more electropositive. In other words, it's gonna try to depolarize the cell. Opposing that, there's going to be some potassium. And the potassium ions, if you look, look what I did here. Sodium is much bigger, potassium is smaller than this. The reason why is, is because less potassium is going to be leaving the cell. You know, we're gonna talk about this when we talk about resting membrane potentials, but if you remember, we just talked about this up there. Here's our resting membrane potential. Here's our threshold potential. Normally in skeletal muscle cells, it's approximately around negative 90 millivolts. Now negative 90 millivolts is close to, very close to, what's called the Nernst the Nernst potential, or the equilibrium potential of potassium. Normally his is like close to like negative 86 millivolts, about. So if that's the case then, potassium isn't gonna wanna leave. He's gonna wanna stay where the, pot, where the actual negative ions are, because right now the cell is negative. And positives are attracted to the negative. So because of that, not much potassium is going to be leaving the cell. Instead, more sodium ions are gonna be attracted to these negative charges and they're gonna flood into the cell. If that's the case then, there's more positive ions coming into the cell than there is positive ions leaving the cell, that's gonna cause the cell to become a little bit electropositive. So what should you see here on the graph? You should see the graph starting to rise, approaching threshold potential. This right here, that rise going towards threshold potential is a specific type of activity. They call this, exerted here by the nicotinic receptors, they call this a motor end plate potential. In other words, it's just a graded potential that you're trying to bring the resting membrane potential up to threshold. And once you hit threshold, we're gonna blast open some voltage-gated sodium channels inside of the sarcolemma. And that'll trigger an action potential inside of the muscle cell. And then if you remember, that'll trigger the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which release the calcium out there, and trigger the whole cross bridge formation to lead to skeletal muscle contraction. What's the big point that I want you to get here? Acetylcholine binds onto the uh, nicotinic receptors in the skeletal muscles. It actually causes sodium ions to flow in. Very, very little potassium ions to flow out, and that creates a motor end plate potential, which is just the thing that we need to be able to stimulate these voltage-gated sodium channels. And upon stimulation of these voltage-gated sodium channels, this will lead to depolarization of the muscle cell. And if you depolarize the muscle cell, this will eventually lead to calcium release. Remember we said they have calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Increasing calcium is going to increase the actual skeletal muscle contraction. Okay, sweet stinking deal. Okay, and that's what you'll see right here. All right, that covers that part. 
Now we've done this part here. Let's now go on to this part here, which is the muscarinic receptors, the G protein coupled receptors. Another name, remember we said this is G protein coupled receptor? We can give it another like umbrella term, like a, a general classification, and we can call this metabotropic receptors. Metabotropic receptors is just basically saying that these are G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so cool. Now what I want to do is I want to focus on the target organs of these muscarinic receptors. So in order for us to do that, we have to come here to the central nervous system. Let's say that I focus on a specific cranial nerve. Doesn't matter which one. I'm just going to say that this is cranial nerve 7. Let's just say for the sake of it that this is cranial nerve 7. But it doesn't necessarily matter. I just want us to get an overall point here. Cranial nerve 7 has this actual nucleus. Then from that, it gives off these axons. From this point now, these axons that are being formed here and going to this actual ganglia, this is called a preganglionic motor neuron. So what do we call this guy right here? We call this neuron the preganglionic parasympathetic nervous system motor neuron. Now, it gets to this area here to this ganglia. And we already said that this has what type of receptors here? If we blow up this area, let's blow this area up a little bit here. So now let's blow this area up so we can see this a little bit better. Let's say here I'm going to have the axon. I'm going to kind of blow out the nerve terminal here. And then same thing here, I'm going to kind of blow out here the cell body. OK. Now, what's important for this, for us to understand here is, the preganglionic motor neuron, we already said, is going to have these vesicles inside of it. And these vesicles, which are going to be rich in acetylcholine, they're going to release that acetylcholine, right? We said that there will be an action potential triggered moving down the axon. And if the action potential is moving down the axon, it'll open up special channels located within the synaptic nerve terminal, which are our voltage-gated calcium channels. And if calcium rushes in, what do we say happens? If calcium rushes in, it stimulates the migration of these synaptic vesicles to the actual membrane. And by doing that, it triggers the exocytosis of acetylcholine. Now, we already know that one of the receptors present here, one of the receptors is going to be the nicotinic. We already said that, that there will be a nicotinic receptor present here. It's going to be the one to trigger the EPSP. But guess what? There's another one present here. The other one present here, and I'm going to talk about it just really quickly because then that's going to lead us into this whole discussion here, is going to be a special type of muscarinic receptor. And this is where we're going to start talking about these. Because muscarinic receptors, we said, are G protein coupled receptors. These are G protein coupled receptors. So this is a nicotinic receptor. This right here is called a muscarinic receptor. And we're going to talk about what specific one it is in just a second. But in order for us to do that, we have to go over the different types of muscarinic receptors in a little bit more detail. So let's do that now. These G protein coupled receptors, well, they're a little bit different. So that's what I want to talk about first before I go into every specific um, muscarinic receptor target organ. So let's go ahead and focus on M1, M2, M3, and we'll talk briefly about M4 and M5, but not a lot. Here's what I want you to remember, though. Make your life easier. Here's what's nice. Start here with the M1. This is going to cause a positive effect. It's going to try to stimulate its target organ. Then we go to M2. This is going to try to inhibit its target organ. Then just flip back and forth. Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. This is why it's so cool. All of the positive muscarinic receptors, the ones that have these positive signs, they work by a special mechanism that we're going to talk about, which is called the GQ protein coupled receptor. 
the negative ones, the muscarinic receptors who have negative signs on them, they work through the G inhibitory pathway. This is why this is so easy now. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at M1, M3, M5, and then we'll do um, M2 and M4, their mechanisms. So let's put here on the cell membrane, let's have our G protein coupled receptor here. So here's going to be this uh, hormone binding domain here, or this uh, ACH, ACH binding domain, and then it has passes through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But it'll have an extra one, that's fine. But it's a serpentine receptor, or we call it a, uh, a G protein coupled receptor, or a seven pass receptor. And what this guy does is, is he stimulates, he binds with a special G protein. Okay, and we said that we're going to focus here on this one being M1, M3, and M5. Okay, let's say that acetylcholine binds onto this M1, M3, or M5 receptor. If it binds onto this M1, M3, or M5 receptor, it stimulates a special G protein located inside of the cell. And we said that this is called GQ protein. GQ is normally bound to GDP, but it gets rid of that GDP. And instead it binds a GTP. This GTP stimulates the GQ protein and activates this GQ protein. When it's activated, it's gonna come down the cell membrane and activate a protein or an effector enzyme that's located in the cell membrane, and this is a special one. And this guy, is called phospholipase C. Phospholipase C. Phospholipase C has the ability to break down a very, very integral component of the cell membrane. This component here is called phosphat phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate. And what phospholipase C does is it breaks that down into two chemicals. One is called inositol triphosphate, or IP3. The other one is called diacylglycerol. Now here's why this is important. If this is some type of cell here, it will have some type of uh, endoplasmic reticulum, maybe even sarcoplasmic reticulum, and what will happen is IP3 will stimulate this endoplasmic reticulum-like structure, and when it does that, it triggers the intracellular release of calcium out into the cytoplasm of whatever this target cell is. Now, upon that release, calcium will bind with a protein called calmodulin. And when it does that, it forms this calcium calmodulin complex, which can activate an uh, enzyme called a calcium calmodulin kinase. Now, the next thing that has to happen is this diacylglycerol, it can activate another enzyme. And this enzyme is called protein kinase C. What happens is protein kinase C and this calcium calmodulin kinase can go and phosphorylate specific proteins and enzymes. So what these guys will do collectively is they will come and phosphorylate special proteins and enzymes. Maybe these proteins, we've talked about it before, maybe they're channel proteins. So maybe these will be channel proteins. And these channel proteins, they're sensitive to the phosphate groups. And if you put a phosphate onto this protein here, so let's say that's going to phosphorylate proteins slash enzymes, you could put a phosphate on this channel. That might activate the channel and trigger calcium ions to load into the cell, stimulating the cell. Who knows? It might phosphorylate different proteins and enzymes that are for metabolic function. So this might be for metabolic enzymes. 
There can be so many different functions of these. We're not going to go into all the details, but what I want you to understand is the overall goal of this pathway is to phosphorylate proteins and enzymes that can play a very, very integral role within either changing membrane permeability, changing metabolic activities, maybe even changing um, the transcription activity of the actual genes. There's so many different things that can happen. Okay, so that covers that part. Now, next thing I want us to see is how does the actual gene inhibitory pathway work? Because this was for M1, M3, M5, that's for GQ. The G inhibitory is for M2 and M4. So let's do this one now. Let's do this guy in this blue color here. So here, now we're going to have our G protein coupled receptor. Here's the domain. And remember, it passes through the membrane a total of seven times. That's why they call it serpentine receptors or seven pass receptors. And what it does is it's connected with what's called a G inhibitory protein. But if you remember, G inhibitory, these G proteins have three different domains. An alpha inhibitory domain, a beta inhibitory domain, and a gamma inhibitory domain. If we release acetylcholine onto M2 and M4 receptors, what will happen is acetylcholine will bind onto this domain here, and it'll trigger the activation of this G inhibitory complex. This whole complex here is called a G inhibitory protein. But what it does is, is remember, it gets rid of GDP and binds GTP, which causes it to become active. Upon that activation, this G inhibitory protein splits into two different components. So watch this. Now we're going to split it into two different components. One is it splits into what's called the beta inhibitory and gamma inhibitory subunit. So look, there's that one subunit there. The other one is it splits into the alpha inhibitory subunit. Why is this important? Generally, these beta and gamma inhibitory subunits are very, very sensitive. Uh, they're very, very good at binding onto channels that are very sensitive to them. You know there's potassium channels? And what happens is these beta and gamma inhibitory subunits can bind onto these potassium channels and lead to the potassium ions leaving the cell. If that happens, what's it going to do to the inside of the cell? Make the cell really negative. If you make the cell really negative, you hyperpolarize the cell. If you hyperpolarize the cell, it's not going to be very active in certain types of activities, and we'll see where. Okay? The next thing is the alpha inhibitory, it does something else. You know there was uh, special different types of enzymes here. One special type of effector enzyme is called adenylate cyclase. So we call this adenylate cyclase. Okay? And adenylate cyclase can respond to that alpha inhibitory subunit. And what happens is it can tell this alpha, uh, this adenylate cyclase, hey, I need you to stop functioning. Adenylate cyclase normally functions to convert ATP into cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP tries to activate protein kinase A. But if you inhibit adenylate cyclase, can it convert ATP into cyclic AMP? No. Can cyclic AMP activate protein kinase A? No. Will you be able to phosphorylate different proteins and enzymes that play a role within membrane permeability or depolarization or metabolic enzymes or transcription? No. This will inhibit the cell. So these are primarily for inhibition of their target organs, and these are primarily for the stimulation of their target organs. That's why this is so cool and so easy. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to talk about where can you actually find M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. Let's make it easy for you. M4, M5, let's put these down here. So here's going to be M4, and then let's put here, let's put muscarinic receptors, and we'll split this out again. M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. M4 and M5 are really easy. The reason why these are really easy 
is because these can only be found in your central nervous system. So these are primarily found in your central nervous system. And when you find these in the central nervous system, what do you think that they do? Come back over here. They play a role within memory. They play a role within arousal, with cognitive functions, and analgesia, pain reduction. So that is what is important about these muscarinic receptors. And they can be found all over, all over the different central nervous system. So that covers these guys. That's easy now. Okay. Now we get onto these guys, M1, M2, M3. M1 is really, we're gonna keep it very, very simple here. M1, we're gonna find it in two specific locations that we're only gonna talk about. There is other places, but we're gonna talk about the most common ones. M1, uh, muscarinic receptors, muscarinic type one receptors, they're gonna be found in generally two locations. One of the big ones is, again, they're gonna be found in the central nervous system. Central nervous system, and again, they're gonna play the exact same role that these guys played. They're gonna play a role in memory, cognition, arousal, and as well as analgesia. Now, the other location is usually you can find it on what's called your gastric glands, okay? So usually you can find this in what's called uh, the gastric glands, but particularly, we're just gonna say the parietal cells, okay? The parietal cells are actually located within the stomach, right? So you know the stomach, you have, we're not going to go into detail on this right now. We'll do this more when we get into GI. But if you have the stomach right here, you have a specific portion here, and they're called gastric uh, pits, right? And then down here from the gastric pits, you have what's called gastric glands. And these gastric glands are responsible for producing and secreting hydrochloric acid. Well, what happens is they have receptors very, very specific to acetylcholine. And actually, there's two different types here. One, they have M1 receptors, and when acetylcholine binds onto these, it will trigger the release of hydrochloric acid. And another thing it will trigger the release of is not just on the parietal cells, um, it can also trigger the chief cells to secrete what's called pepsinogen. Pepsino. Gin. So these are the two chemicals, but it's not just M1 receptors they found down there too. They have also found another different type of receptor there as well, and this is M3, muscarinic receptors. So there's two different types here in the gastric glands, M1 receptors and M3 receptors. But again, the basic function here for the parietal cells is triggering the release of hydrochloric acid and even a little bit of this protein digesting enzyme called pepsinogen. That covers M1, done. M2, M2 is a lot easier. It's mainly going to target two different places. One is the heart, okay? So it's gonna target the heart. So if you know here, we have the heart, right? You're gonna have two different locations on the heart. You have the SA node, and you have what's called the AV node. So let's hit, say here is the SA node, and then here is going to be the AV node, and then you have your uh, bundle of Hiss, and then from the bundle of Hiss, it splits into the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch, right? Well, what's specific here is that there is specific types of receptors present on the SA node and the AV node. So let's pretend we put a receptor right here, and we put a receptor right here on the SA node and the AV node. So one right here, this is going to be SA node, and this right here is going to be AV node. Now, if acetylcholine acts on these two receptors, so here, here's our acetylcholine, and it acts on this receptor, or it acts on this receptor, it's going to decrease the action potentials. It's going to hyperpolarize the cell. Which one of these guys cause potassium ion efflux? M2 and M4. If potassium ions leave the cell, it's going to make the cell negative. It's going to inhibit the cell. That should make sense. So what type of receptors should we see here? Well, M4 is only on the central nervous system. The only other inhibitory one is M2. So we should expect M2 receptors, muscarinic type, two receptors present on the SA node, AV node, and if you really want, they're also present with on the bundle of Hiss. So they call this, if it inhibits the SA node, negative chronotropic agent. 
If it inhibits the AV node, it's a negative bathmotropic agent. And if it inhibits the actual bundle of hits, it's a negative dromotropic agent. Okay, so that's one. We can find it present on the actual heart. Oh, that's a beautiful red, right? So SA node and AB node. And yes, we can throw another one on there, which is the bundle of his or the AV bundle. One more area, and that is actually going to be present on the presynaptic membrane. Okay, so you know acetylcholine, when acetylcholine is released here, you know there's special enzymes that will degrade it called acetylcholinesterase. So there is special enzymes here. Pretend here I'm going to have him like this. Here's this like Pac-Man looking dude here. And that Pac-Man looking dude right there is called acetylcholinesterase. So this is called acetyl, I'm going to put A-C-H-E. That is acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase will degrade the acetylcholine. But let's say that acetylcholine is able to come over here. There's a special receptor present on the presynaptic membrane that can inhibit the further release of acetylcholine. This receptor is called M2 receptor. So you can also have a receptor here. This is called M2 receptor, muscarinic type 2 receptor. And if acetylcholine binds here, it will cause potassium ion efflux and it will inhibit the calcium entry by inhibiting the protein kinase enzymes. If you do this, it will inhibit calcium release. And if you inhibit the calcium entry, this is going to inhibit the actual what? Inhibit the release of acetylcholine. And it will trigger what else? potassium ions to leave the cell, which will make the cell electronegative, hyperpolarizing the cell. So we can also find M2 receptors on the presynaptic nerve terminals. So presynaptic nerve terminals. And the last one is M3. M3 is where you can find pretty much everywhere else. So what are some of these areas? The big thing I want you to remember is you can find M3 on any type of exocrine gland. Any type of exocrine glands. So what are some of these exocrine glands that I'm talking about? The lacrimal glands. The lacrimal glands have M3 receptors, so it's going to increase the production of lacrimal fluid. What else? Salivary glands, the parotid, the submandibular, the sublingual, they're going to have M3 receptors, increasing the production of saliva. Sweat glands have M3 receptors. They can start producing sweat. And even the pancreas, the pancreatic sinai, they can make digestive juices. What else? Even the gastric glands, too, have M3 receptors that we said. Okay, so I want you to remember that exocrine glands could be like lacrimal glands, could be like salivary glands, could be like sweat glands, it could be the pancreatic sinus, right, or it could even be gastric glands. And again, that's all going to be a stimulatory effect. The next thing is it can act on smooth muscle, but the big places that it can act here, let's actually do this one here in black, uh, no, let's do it here in this baby blue color. Keep it going. The next place is it can act on the smooth muscle of the bronchi. So because it can act on the bronchi, it can produce what's called bronchoconstriction. Okay, so it can actually act on the bronchi of the actual lungs. And if it acts on that, it's going to activate the M3 receptors. M3 receptors load the cells with calcium. If you load the cell with calcium, it's going to cause contraction of that actual muscle cell. And it's going to narrow the airway. What else? Think about the GI tract. The entire GI tract, the smooth muscle of the GI tract. If you look at the GI tract, it should have M3 receptors, which is going to be important for what? Peristalsis and segmentation and hydrochloric acid secretion and pepsinogen secretion and intestinal secretions. So it is pro-GI activity. So it can be found on the GI tract smooth muscle. And again, you can remember parasympathetic is for resting, digesting, urinating. Oh, urinating. So what else would it be doing? It's going to be helping to allow for urine production. So specifically, it causes the bladder contractions. So it can actually cause the bladder 
contractions. What else did we say it does? Not only does it act on the GI tract to move the food, but it helps you to drop the poo, right? It helps you to drop that log. So that's important too because your internal anal sphincter is also having a little bit of parasympathetic tone. So because of that, it's not only going to be important for helping to make actual urine, but it's also going to be present on the GI tract to allow for defecation. So it can help in the process of defecation because defecation is a parasympathetic spinal cord mediated reflex. One more place that I want to mention before we end it off here is the eye, okay? Inside of the eye, let's come over here for a second. Inside of the eye, you know that there is actually going to be, uh, if we look at the eye here, here let's say here we have the eye here, here's the lens, and then here you're going to have the ciliary body, right? So here's our actual eye. Well, on this, you're going to have special muscles, two special muscles here. One is going to be located right here, which is a part of the ciliaris muscle. So there's going to be the ciliaris muscle right here. The next one is that there's going to be a part of the iris. There's also going to be a part of the iris. These guys have to also have receptors specific to the acetylcholine. So on the ciliaris muscle, it actually has M3 receptors. And if you have M3 receptors, it's going to load the cell with calcium. If it loads the cell with calcium, it's going to cause the ciliaris to contract. If the ciliaris contracts, it pulls the actual fixed end forward. If it does that, it causes the suspensory ligaments that hold the lens to become very loose. If it becomes loose, the lens becomes globular. So the lens becomes globular. And if the lens becomes globular, this is going to allow for us to only see things that are actually going to be nearby. So this is going to produce what's called near vision. The next thing is there's also going to be the muscles here on the pupil. So they should have M3 receptors. Load them with calcium, they're going to contract. This is called the constrictor pupillae. And if this contracts, it'll actually narrow the pupil. And if you narrow the pupil, it allows for less light to come in and hit the retina. All right, engineers, so that pretty much covers cholinergic receptors. I hope it made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. If you guys stuck in throughout the whole video, can't say thank you enough. I know sometimes the videos can be a little longer, but our whole purpose here is to try to make this stuff make sense, which is sometimes, as a side effect, a little longer than we want. But I hope that you guys did learn something, and I hope that you guys truly did enjoy it. If you guys did, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, if you guys get a chance, please hit that Facebook, uh, go to check out our Facebook, our Instagram, maybe even our Patreon account. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.